Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'll start by saying that uh, this presentation is uh, not made up, or the work for this presentation is not done by uh, my myself alone. It's a uh, joint work between me and uh, Dimitri Milekus, who uh, unfortunately couldn't be here uh, today. Uh, so for the next 20 minutes, more or less, I'll take you to the to wonderful world of uh, oxen, uh, these little big animals that you see depicted here, and uh, ox transfer. Well, we, we all know that uh, movement, so movement of goods, movement of people, is, is a vital part in, in all human societies. Uh, but for complex societies, uh, this importance is even greater. Uh, complex societies, because uh, in complex societies, the production of goods tends, tends to be distributed geographically among all members, all <coughs> cities, all towns uh, of that society. Now, a good example of such a complex society is the Roman, uh, the Roman world. Uh, in the Roman world, um, the production of goods is actually uh, has a very well developed trade system, uh, with production of goods such as uh, olive oil, uh, wine, um, stone, uh, and pottery, for example. Um, these objects tend to be uh, moved around over long distances and uh, enormous uh, quantities. Now, Dimitri and I, uh, we believe that um, the move or the distribution of these goods is uh, particularly uh, related by the costs of their transport. And that the physical geof geography of the terrain or can impose a, ma a major constraint on the movement of, uh, of these goods. Now, uh, water transport, we have two main types of transport for goods uh, in pre-industrial societies. We have water transport, land transport. Uh, in Rome, for the Roman world, uh, water transport has already received quite a lot of uh, scholarly attention. Uh, land transport, on the other hand, uh, a lot less uh, has been uh, dealt with, a lot more uh, superficially. And this is actually a bit surprising, considering uh, that uh, most urban centers in the Roman world could only be reached uh, by land transport. So land transport was actually an inevitable part of the, of the Roman world or of the Roman economy. Uh, that's also why I'm thankful for the organization of, uh, of this session to uh, help to promote uh, the attention for land transport a bit. So uh, what I'll be talking about uh, in this presentation is uh, about uh, a model, the energy, we call it the energy scape model, that Dimitri and I have, have made uh, for modeling or for uh, predicting the energy costs for transporting loads, especially heavy and bulky loads uh, over a particular landscape. Um, using this model, we, cre we uh, created several scenarios. In 40 several scenarios, uh, the several energy networks or transport networks, we will then compare them to see if there's difference in the structure of these networks and also differences in, uh, let's say, key points, uh, key sites or central sites in uh, these networks that uh, helped to um, help in the direction or that uh, govern the direction and the quantity uh, of flow of goods uh, in these networks. And then in the final part, I'll uh, present some uh, preliminary, preliminary work that we've been doing. Uh, it's actually a case study uh, where we compare these transport networks with the trade of marble in the Roman world. Okay, uh, short introduction to the area where we're at. Uh, so we're in central Adriatic Italy. Um, it's, uh, the study area is compri uh, comprises about 1,500 square kilometers. It has 60 Roman uh, urban centers, 60 Roman towns in it. And it's uh, roughly located between uh, the Apennines in the west and the Adriatic Sea in the east. And it is centered around the Roman, uh, the Roman port city, the major city in the area this works, uh, of, uh, of Ancona. So it's one of the major ports on the Adriatic Sea. Uh, if we look at, well, it's actually for, uh, from an economical, Roman economical point of view, it's uh, a relatively important region in the sense that it has a large scale production of olive oil and wine that was exported outside of the area as well, essentially to the other side of the Adriatic, but also to the entire Eastern Mediterranean area. Uh, a lot of products from the area have been encountered, for example, in Athens, in Delos, and uh, along uh, other sites in the, uh, on the Turkish, modern Turkish uh, coast. Now, if we look at the geography, at the geology of the, of the, of the area, um, we can see that there are no, uh, there are practically no uh, suitable resources or geological resources that are useful for uh, decoration purposes. There are no stones of qu high quality that can be used for uh, decorating public or uh, private monumental buildings. So all of these goods uh, had to be imported to the area. 
So we have uh, a lot of export in the area, so uh, olive oil, wine, but also a lot of import, for example, of these stones, which we'll, uh, I'll come back to later. Now, the geography of, or the geomorphology of the terrain is, so we have on the eastern side, we have the Apennine Mountains, on the western side, we have the Adriatic, and both of these are linked uh, by a series of parallel or sub-parallel uh, rivers. However, um, geomorphological and geological studies have uh, showed us that uh, none of these rivers uh, in the past, in the Roman times, uh, could be navigated upon. So actually all of the transport in the era, so all of the import and export transport, uh, had to uh, occur over land. <coughs> okay, the model itself now. Um, the, the, the Roman Empire, we can consider that, or we can see that as actually a giant <laughs> organism that uh, existed primarily uh, through uh, the continuous flow of people and of goods. So people, uh, armies, traders and so forth, goods, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, uh, pottery, olive oil, wine, but also uh, stone. And actually through this uh, continuous flow, uh, constantly new associations between uh, different entities of the empire are being created. Now, this movement of goods and people uh, requires an enormous amount of energy. And for pre-industrial uh, societies, this transport um, or the energy needed for this transport, for land transport that was uh, delivered by uh, animals and by humans, for water transport that was delivered by the sea current and by the winds, essentially. Now, this reliance upon energy of external sources also imposed serious constraint upon uh, the transport of these goods, increasing the cost of these goods as transport became more difficult, and thus also directly influencing the degree to, to which uh, people could act, uh, actively engage in the exchange of goods. Now, with the work that, uh, that uh, Dimitri and I did, we wanted to see to what extent um, energetic considerations of land transport were or were not uh, a main factor or uh, a determinant in uh, the Roman economy or in the distribution of uh, bulky and heavy goods across uh, a land. And we'll do that by illustrating that with uh, some work uh, considering marble decoration. Now, for land transport, uh, land transport of heavy goods, of bulky hoods, goods, uh, this happened essentially using uh, ox-drawn wagons or ox-drawn uh, carts. And this, this kind of animal traction uh, was essentially uh, influenced by or was influenced by many mechanical and biological factors. Mechanical factors being the, the topography, of, topography of the terrain, the design of the cart, uh, the harnessing system, um, the ground resistance, uh, etc. For biological factors, I can think of uh, the size of the animal, the type of the animal, obviously, the size of the animal, the gender uh, of the animal, the, the sex of the animal, uh, its general condition, its general health, uh, how it's being fed, etc. Now, for uh, designing our model, uh, we essentially looked at the four parameters, uh, at four values that um, we found in literature were most influencing the um, how energy was consumed uh, with ox cart transport. So what I have here is uh, actually four graphs with on the left side uh, all of the, the, the parameters, all of the variables that um, produced energy for the movement. On the right side all of the parameters that uh, consumed energy during uh, ox cart transport. So um, as a rule of thumb we can say that uh, one ox uh, can uh, at least or one well-conditioned ox, an ox in a good health can uh, deliver a force of about 10 to 12 percent of its uh, of its body weight, and that for a longer period of time, so throughout the day. For shorter periods of time, this can go up to 24 to 30 percent, but that's only for shorter uh, periods of time. So actually, the amount of uh, draft force that uh, an ox uh, can um, can 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 make uh, depends primarily on its uh, on its weight. Now, obviously, this does not mean that the transport uh, of, of goods was limited to, to what one ox could, uh, could move around. Uh, increasing the number of animals in a span obviously increases the total draft capacity of the team. However, this is not by a constant, uh, constant amount. Uh, the more animals that you add to a team, the less each one individually contributes to the total draft capacity of, of the ox team. And that is because of a loss of... Um, a loss of uh, efficiency due to uh, coordination uh, coordination problems. This is what you see in the bottom uh, left uh, graph. Now, theoretically, this means that actually any load can be uh, moved around uh, using oxen as long as your uh, team is large enough. 
This is something that we see, for example, in the Roman Empire. If you look at the, the Pantheon in Rome, if you see the massive columns uh, and how much they have weighed, uh, they cannot be moved with a team of, of less than, let's say, 20 oxen, for example. However, increasing uh, the number of animals in your span also has uh, several uh, disadvantages. In a sense, uh, you need more people to guide the animals. There are some coordination problems, but also uh, some practical stuff like um, if you have a large span, uh, maneuvering these, for example, in hairpins becomes practically impossible just because of the size of the span and the size of the load. So those are the two things that we use in our model uh, to uh, calculate how much energy, energy an ox team can, uh, can produce. There are also several stuff that um, are important or several things that consume energy during transport. Uh, and that foremost, uh, that foremost is, uh, of course, the topography, topography of the terrain over which one is moving. Um, pulling uphill uh, obviously uh, consumes more energy than moving uh, downhill, than pulling downhill, let's say. <laughs> and for these reasons, of course, uh, the strateg strategies for moving, uh, for ascending and for descending uh, are, in some cases, quite different, let's say. Now, apart from topography, uh, the second most influential factor in this uh, in this thing is the load, uh, the the weight of the load that's being moved around. So, uh, how much do the objects that we transport, how much do they weigh? So, we have the goods that are being transported, the weight of those, but also the cart uh, on which this is transported. And we know from uh, iconographical, uh, ethnographical, and archaeological evidence that a general um, that large and bulky goods uh, such as uh, stone, for example are being moved around on uh, ox carts, uh, four-wheeled ox carts, uh, let us say, that weighed approximately between 250 and 300 kilogram. Now, larger wagons uh, obviously existed uh, when you had to move uh, extraordinary, uh, extraordinary weights, such as, for example, these, uh, these columns of the Pantheon. Now, this brings us to, to cart uh, design and uh, the last thing that we incorporated in our model, and that is uh, the rolling resistance. So. Um, which then depends on uh, the, the type of wagon that you use, the wheels, the materials of which it is made, but essentially uh, on the surface upon which it is uh, being moved. Now, using these uh, main parameters, so let's say team size, uh, the weight of the ox or the size of the, of the animal, uh, cart weight, uh, the, the weight of the load, uh, the topography and the surface conditions, uh, we use these as an input for our model, our energy scape model that we um, that we made in combination with uh, the G distance, G distance package in uh, R. And using uh, this, we calculated cost surfaces and uh, least, cost paths, least cost paths for traversing a landscape uh, with, as an output, the energy expenditure uh, for that moving over a particular uh, trajectory. No. Uh, for, um, with this model, we then created uh, several scenarios. Exactly, we created four scenarios uh, where, where we um, simulated the movement of uh, goods with different uh, loads, or the movement of carts with different loads, going from zero kilograms, so an empty cart, uh, towards loads of uh, 1,700 kilograms. And for each of these scenarios, we calculated all of the possible uh, connections all of the possible paths between all pairs of uh, destinations and sources. So all, all the cities were connected uh, using our model. And for each of these paths, we then calculated the distance of the path, the time it costs for doing uh, the trajectory during the trip, and also the energy uh, expenditure uh, for that particular path. Now, if you look at uh, these two plots, we can see something very uh, very clear in a sense is that for the the load the, the higher load the load of 1700 uh, kilograms we see that the paths are converging much more than for uh, the the one with the empty cart meaning uh, or which is obvious or indicating that uh, trend that topography and cart were one of the most influential factors uh, in our uh, in our model now also if you look at the 1700 kilogram uh, we can see actually that the main corridors in our uh, transport in our study area were more, were located more or less north south, with only mi minor uh, corridors going east west, so linking the sea with the inlands. Now, and if we compare that to what we know uh, in, uh, in historic of the historical evidence, we can say that the central uh, route, which is does this work? No, let's use this one. Uh, the central route, so this one, corresponds to one of the major roads uh, in the area, which is uh, called the Via Salaria Gallica. 
uh, and the inland roads, which is this <coughs> one, corresponds to the Via Flaminia, which was one of the most important roads uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Roman Italy, and which, in, uh, for our study, era connected the site of uh, Rimini, Ariminu, with, uh, directly with, uh, with the city of Rome. And this road also f uh, formed the basis of the Romanization of, uh, of our study area, which was actually very interesting. Now, the results of what we did here, uh, we use that to, as a basis for creating a network uh, for all four uh, scenarios. But we also uh, subdivided these four scenarios into two different uh, types of uh, transports. We have a short distance transport and a long distance uh, transport. With short distance transport, meaning that the guard has to be able to return to his base station within one day. And uh, for lo long distance transport, that it uh, did, not have to, did not have that condition, let's say. So for short distance transport, depending on load, this meant that we could travel between uh, 15, more or less 15 and a half kilometers and 20 kilometers, 21 kilometers. For long distance transport, between 33 and a half and 42 uh, kilometers. So uh, if you quickly look at the, the networks that uh, were created using this, uh, these two, uh, these eight scenarios in a sense, we can see some very clear differences. Uh, and we can see that the network for the short distance transport, which you can see on the left, um, is actually a lot less dense, a lot more fragmented, uh, meaning that this type of transport could only be used, could not be used for regional trade because uh, not enough sites are connected in this, uh, in this, uh, in this uh, environment. Then the second thing that we looked at was uh, the between a centrality to identify some uh, central sites or the key sites in the, in our networks. This is so. This is for the long distance trans transport because we were interested in regional trade, uh, and we can see that there are some sites with uh, a higher uh, between a centrality value, which are and this uh, becomes even these are more clear and the high and the you see this uh, this becomes more clear in the. Uh, yes, this is a trend that becomes more clear if we um, have higher uh, higher loads that are being transported. And these are sites that are essentially the uh, are laying on the north uh, south uh, uh, routes uh, in the inland in the mid valley area of our study area. Uh, it's, it's the same, but a bit higher loads. Now we wanted to go to our case study now, uh, and we wanted to see. Um, to what extent uh, the trade of marble uh, could have been influenced uh, by uh, by the, the transport networks or by the difficulty in transport in our study area. So it's generally believed that transport uh, constituted a major expense in the movement or in, in construction projects in pre-industrial times, with costs for transport sometimes even exceeding the cost of the actual material itself. Now, if this is true also for uh, marble projects, which is a luxury good, this should be reflected in the distribution, uh, in the distribution pattern of uh, of our goods. And deviations in the distribution patterns in relation to transport cost could indicate that there are some other forces except for transport costs that are at work here. So what we did is uh, we compared uh, the marble sandwiches from seven sites um, with the results of our uh, energy scape model and our uh, network study. Uh, all of these sites show uh, a wide range of imported stones that came from uh, essentially Greece, North Africa, Egypt, and, uh, and Turkey. Now, for comparing these uh, sites or the assemblage of these sites, we looked at some very simple measures uh, of the overall composition of the assemblages, being size uh, of, the, of the assemblage, being uh, the richness of the assemblage, and being the evenness of the uh, assemblage. So size uh, being just the total number of items in our assemblage, um, obviously, this does not very informative, as this can reflect uh, the size of the original assemblage, but also uh, is heavily influenced by post-depositional uh, processes. Second one, richness, being the number of categories in our uh, assemblage. But again, this is also not very informative, as larger assemblages have uh, a higher probability of uh, including more, uh, uh, of having a higher richness just because of their uh, sample size, because of the size of the assemblage. And this also makes uh, assemblages of different size very difficult to compare with each other. Now, a uh, third measure that we then actually used was uh, evenness, and it's a, a measure, a statistical measure, that uh, actually tries to circumvent the problems of size and of uh, richness. So basically what evenness does is it looks essentially at the relative uh, 
proportion of each uh, material category that's in our assemblage. Uh, so what, and you can measure that or you can calculate that using the Shannon Wiener uh, index. That is then divided by the maximum value of the observed uh, richness to uh, move the effects of size of the, of the assemblage that you study and to remove the effect of uh, differences in richness. And what you have then is uh, a statistic between a zero and one interval, with uh, zero being a very un meaning a very uneven assemblage. Uh, so an assemblage where one material category dominates, one or a few mater material categories dominate, and one indicating, uh, indicating uh, a completely even assemblage uh, where all of the material categories uh, are present in more or less the same uh, proportion. So now um, for uh, actually doing the comparison with our, our transports and with the assemblages, um, there are two basic assumptions that we need to address here that I need to note here, and that is first, um, assemblages with similar compositions are likely to be the result of, uh, of similar processes of deposition. And also sites that are located in more central locations are sites uh, in the transport network are sites that are more easily accessible uh, for marble traders. And vice versa then, while sites that are located more peripherally in the transport networks are less accessible, of course. Now, for our case study here, the Central Adriatic, we could say that our uh, objects, our marble objects, arrived from the different quarries uh, through uh, the main port in the area. In our case, this is the city of Ancona, and that the price of marble at that location uh, was determined primarily by the price of the raw material, the price of its quarrying and processing, plus the price of the transport from quarry to harbor. Now, once it reached the, the harbor, it was redistributed throughout our study area, and the evolution of the price of the, the marble objects at this point would then finally be determined by the uh, transport costs from harbor to uh, the final construction <coughs> site or the final site of consumption. The effect this has on the price of the marble is that um, cheaper, uh, that the price difference between uh, cheaper and more expensive marbles would become, uh, become smaller, meaning that it becomes relatively cheaper to import uh, more expensive uh, marbles. So if this is hypothesis is true, uh, we should see they're still reflected in uh, the evenness and between the centrality of our uh, study or of, of our study sites. So sites with lower uh, between the centrality values, so sites that are uh, less easy to uh, to reach, uh, should have marble assemblages with a higher uh, evenness value, because it becomes more cheaper for them to import the more expensive uh, expensive. Marbles. So what we did very preliminary was just plotting these two values over each other and seeing how this relates. So we should see uh, for sites with lower, we should see a negative correlation basically between uh, sites that are uh, difficult uh, between uh, betweenness and evenness uh, values. Now the first two plots are uh, obviously not much uh, of interest for us because yeah, if you have a cart load with zero kilograms, yeah, you're not transporting everything, and the same for uh, 300 kilogram loads. Um, it's not very logic that uh, goods like stone will be transported in such a way. So, especially if we look at the large, uh, the last uh, plot, uh, which we can, the one on the, the bottom left, uh, the bottom right here, we can see uh, maybe the beginning of a trend of such a negative correlation, uh, indicating that uh, transport costs might have, uh, also for luxury goods, might have been important in the transport uh, of these goods or in the distribution of these goods. Uh, however, we need to be careful because we're only studying seven sites, which is not enough uh, to say something uh, very, or to have uh, really far-going uh, conclusions about this. Obviously, we also need to take into account that other factors might be at play, such as, for example, uh, fashion, ideology, or intervention of the states uh, in the area. Which is uh, something that could be true, for example, here for uh, this site uh, here. So what I've plotted here was the evenness values of the of the different sites as points, uh, plus the evenness value uh, of a simulated uh, simulated approach. Um, so if all of our marble objects from all of these sites are put together in a bag, and you randomly uh, pull out uh, 600 uh, 600 pieces of marble, how would the evenness value be? Uh, of that uh, of that sample that you take, so we did that a thousand times for all of the for all of the values that are indicated here, going from uh, one to two thousand. Uh, so this could indicate that for for this side there might this has a very large uh, evenness value that there might be some other uh, factors at play here. 
So as uh, part of a conclusion, um, the energy scape model that we produce here, uh, we think that it, offers, or it has a possibility to offer a, a good analytical tool for understanding the cost and, uh, of movement and transport uh, of goods, of heavy goods in a, in a particular landscape. And it perhaps can uh, allow us to have a better understanding of how transport, land transport acts as a structuring variable uh, for the Roman economy. Now, a first appreciation of our case study uh, seems to indicate that uh, there is a, a correlation or there is a relationship between transport and distribution of goods, uh, as, I, uh, as I told about. But we still have to be careful because we don't have enough uh, sites yet. Um, and it's partly because uh, marble uh, assemblages are normally not studied, if, uh, studied quantitatively, only qualitatively. So basically what uh, normal people do is uh, identify the stone types and that's it. They don't do any count or at least they don't record it in publications. So uh, what I'll be doing this summer is going back to the study area, study more sites, uh, do quantitative studies for all of these sites, so to have a large data set. Another step would be to include also contextual information. So what type of uh, structure are we, are we looking at, private structures or um, public structures, which could, have, uh, which could indicate or could give us more information about how these goods are transported. And finally, we also, we also would like to uh, improve our model a little bit to uh, incorporate or to uh, incorporate travel speed uh, more because we're working now with average values of transport. Uh, we'd like to adapt that to also to the topography and the load that is being uh, transfer, uh, transported. Thank you. <laughs>